This is my family. Uh, um, my wife is Renee. She's here tonight. My parents are here. Uh, she's a pianist. And I have four children. My oldest son is the one kind of grinning right there next to me. And he and his wife just had a baby, so I'm getting used to the label of grandfather. I'm trying to get my head around that. All right, next. This is snapping back 30 years ago, almost 30 years ago. And my wife and I, in this picture, um, we're getting ready to deliver paintings to my first art show. So you can see, it's kind of a humorous picture of um, kind of naive and enthusiasm and hope. And, and we had just graduated from Indiana University. She was in the music school. And um, I was in the art department. So we just graduated, getting ready to deliver paintings to my first show. And we were getting ready to get married that summer and moved to New York City, where I was going to get my master's at the New York Academy of Art. So this is kind of a pivotal uh, photo, and that serves as a quick bio. So next, um, and next. At the Academy, I learned all about the figure. I'd, I'd already painted landscape a good bit, so I wanted to learn about the figure next. And when I graduated after two years, an extraordinary thing happened, and that was nothing. It was, <laughs> it was total silence. So no one, no gallery saw my thesis painting and decided to represent me, and I wasn't picked up for any tenure track position. It was complete silence. I was actually remembering kind of a painful memory as I was, some of us were, we're um, taking our stuff out of the academy, walking down the street, you know, in New York there. Some of the custodians at the, at the academy kind of like started laughing and called out like, we're going to look for a box to sleep in or something. I was like, wow, that's, that's kind of a sobering, uh, sobering thing to hear on your way out of the, the academy. So this is one of the first paintings I did when I got out of grad school. And this will give you a picture of what I was feeling at the time, which is basically, no fish. And, you know, there is hope. There's like the star in the sky. And behind me, you see that, that gaping black door. So that, that definitely, I was, when I painted that, I was definitely thinking of kind of the fear, the uncertainty. I was feeling like, how am I ever going to, you know, support my family, have a family, support a family? So next. And two good things did happen right away. Well, the first one is, I, I got my first job almost immediately when I um, when I left at the academy, and that job was the grand jury, New York City grand jury, every, every morning for a month, and I got paid for it. So that actually gave me something to do. The other thing is, by a real fluke, um, that fall I, I applied to all these teaching jobs. I got one back to teach one drawing class. And when I got to school that morning, the guy was like, wait, he was looking at my resume. You don't have any teaching experience? So, but I got that job. So that kind of got me going. So next. And I started, I, I felt I had been advised by my mentor, and I felt, look, the important thing is just start painting. Painting is the most important thing to get painting. So I was painting on the street in New York, which is quite the adventure. And next. Uh, paint, paintings in Central Park. I was going up the Palisades Park, and I just trying to figure out what to paint. And you guys know um, there's a song. I think it's 126, but it talks about uh, a sower weeping, going out to the fields weeping and casting a seed, and then he comes back rejoicing. When, when I read that at that time in my life, that became a part of. Um, a big part of what, what I felt needed to guide me. Because I was like getting all rejections. Up to this day, I've got a stack about an inch thick of rejections from like galleries, grants, teaching jobs, but I keep it to show my kids and my students. But something about that picture of the, the sower uh, casting a seed and weeping, it's like I'm not going to focus on what is growing at all at a certain point. I'm just going to keep focus on just casting seed. And, um, you know, that can be kind of a quaint picture, but you think about it. A farmer that's going out weeping, 
That farmer is in distress. He doesn't have a lot of hope. He's not even competent, probably. If you think about a farmer, like crying. So, um, but he's casting his seed. And so that's what, I, that's what I focused on. That's what I tried to focus on. Um, next slide. And the other big problem I was having is, how do I know what to paint? You know, it's like my whole art career is in front of me. The teaching's over. I've got a studio in Brooklyn and a warehouse. Like, what do I paint? So one thing that struck me, I'd love to go and walk around the uh, Met, Metropolitan Museum of Art, because it was free. At, at that time, it was free. And the thing that always struck me over and over is, through all the ages of art, painting, and I'm going to speak as a painter tonight. I know I've got other people here. Um, painting can be about anything. That's what struck me over and over. So I asked myself this question. If, if I could paint just one painting in the world, just one, what would that painting be? That was how I decided to start. So next slide. Next. And this is one of the first paintings that came out of that thinking. This is one of the first paintings I did when I got out of grad school. And here I am, you've got a picture of this warehouse with pigeons everywhere um, in New York City. I'm not painting what's around me really. I'm just picturing where I grew up going to the beach. Because that was like precious to me. This is a cottage we rented every year. So in this painting, it's got my family vacationing, but really, this painting is about that center. See the cloud that's centered and the wave that's centered, and the centrality of that. And that, that to me, that's a central um, figure in the landscape is important because it made me feel like, look, people are doing their own thing all the world, but there's a reality. That reality is, is God. And it's giving meaning and order and truth to everything, even if people are unaware of it. So that's kind of what that painting's about. This is another painting um, during that time. And in this one, I'm, I'm really trying to stretch myself. I was, I was I always try and challenge myself with the next painting I'm doing, like push myself to get a little bit of a place I'm not sure what to do. So this is a real place, but I've moved things around to get all the views I want. So, I wanted to see out the pier, I wanted to see under the pier, those, those uh, rays of light under the pier. I wanted to see through the, bait, through the bait house and out into the ocean again. I wanted to see down into that tank. And I wanted the feel of noontime at the beach when you're it's like so hot and you're coming off the pier and then entering this, this coolness. So that was that painting. Uh, this was a sketch I did for it next. This is, uh, at this point, I moved my studio into, uh, we lived in a hotel. And this is right before we left New York City. And I, I have to tell you, it was kind of a cool picture. At that time, it was a one bedroom. And I, when you walked in, there was one closet where there was one baby, kind of, uh, we had built a bed in there. Then the next closet was a toddler. And then <laughs> one room was where we ate and slept. And then in the bedroom is where I had my studio, my wife had her, Penis. So literally, we had days where I'm in my, I'm painting. My wife's playing piano. There's a violinist. There's a baby on the floor. It was like right out of a lot of web. So, um, next slide. So we decided to, at a certain point, New York outpriced us, and we wanted to. We were missing family, missing nature. So we moved to Waynesville, where my parents had retired. And you guys will kind of laugh at me, but I, I didn't realize when I moved here. What an incredible place this was for a landscape painter. Because yeah. um, when you're in New York, you think you're in the center of the universe. Um, so we moved to Waynesville next. And C.S. Lewis is my hero, my total hero. I, I, my mom introduced um, me to him. And he wrote a book called The Great Divorce. And there's one chapter there that's about artists, and I really wanted to read the whole chapter to you. But I was like, Luke, you can't do that. <laughs> so I'm just going to read you the, the, kind of the climax of that chapter. Basically what's happening, there's an artist in heaven, another artist is visiting heaven, and the, the, the heavenly artist, if you will, is trying to convince him to stay. But the visiting artist, he's like all about his career, his the, the art of painting, um, his reputation, and here's what he says to him, the, the artist that's in heaven. He says, no, no, painting wasn't your first love, it was not. 
Light itself was your first love. You loved paint only as a means of telling about life. Every poet and musician and artist, but for grace, is drawn away from the love of the thing he tells to love of the telling. Till down in deep hell, they cannot be interested in God at all, but only in what they have to say about him. They sink lower, become interested in their own personalities, and then in nothing but their own reputations. So when I read that, um, that put a deep conviction in me. It was kind of like, uh, when, I, when I read this, this almost came up, became a whole guide for my, my art and faith. And it put the conviction in me that somehow I wanted to put my painting, like, in a way, not think about it, put it behind me. And I wanted all, all my attention focused on, on the thing that I'm delighting in, something outside myself that I'm glorying in, and somehow try to keep my focus there. Now, I'm a perceptual painter, so that has to do with um, you know, me looking at and loving the thing I'm painting. Uh, for other modes of painting, it's different, but I think the principle is the same, is that we don't, we, we try and keep our focus on what's inspiring us, not how we're doing, not how we're fitting into uh, the art scene, art history, how good a painter we are, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but that was a, a huge uh, thing for me when I read that. Okay, and this is um, this is a landscape I did a few years after I came to Waynesville, and it's it's definitely an example of that for me. I, I mean, it's a painting of a the barn, but really, it's a painting about the beauty of the light on that central figure. Even the shadow on it is this glowing blue shadow. And that, whenever I see something like that that just enthralls me, that's where I want all my attention. And not worry about my style even. What my style's gonna do, let the style do what it's want, what it wants to do. I wanna put all my attention on what I'm loving, the light. So, next slide. I love being outdoors. Uh, Matt and I have talked about struggling in the studio before. Um, I don't always love to paint. I'll tell you that. It can be um, a trial. It can be drudgery sometimes. Uh, it's a lot of problem solving. You get stuck. It's backtracking. It's hard like getting that zone where things are rolling. Once you get there, it's great. But getting to that place, is, it's hard for me. That's my experience. But I love to be outside. Um, and that's usually one of the ways that I can get there. Um, I like the whole accoutrements of painting outside. I built my own easels and art boxes, like the challenge of the wind and everything going. Uh, this is a, actually a, a pretty new painting. This is a, a farm, it's an old dairy barn, a dairy farm. And when I find a, a scene, a beautiful scene, some of you talk about landscape painting, you'll realize pretty quickly, um, you know, not every beautiful place can make a beautiful painting. So. When I find a, a scene that's like, wow, this is knocking my socks off, I spend a lot of time like finding a vantage point that gives the painting uh, an abstract design that is powerful enough to convey the beauty of the scene. So, for instance, in this painting, it's, it's pretty obvious. You know, there's that central, that beautiful square in the middle, and then your eye zooms up the left-hand side, and then zooms down the right side where the cattle stalls are. So I, I spend a lot of time looking and then finding a spot that that has that uh, powerful abstract pattern. And, and usually, um, you know, when I'm out in the countryside and I, and I find that spot that really bowls me over to me, it's like the painting's done. I just have to be, be faithful to, to love and record what I'm seeing. This is a pretty recent painting. It's called Mockingbird because every, every day I went there, I would, um, this mockingbird would come visit me. You can't see him because the slide's blurry, but I put him in the center of the painting where his nest was. Okay, next. Um, Ian Forster, I love Ian Forster novels. And one thing he said that I really love about, about art, he said, um, art is not so much like laying bricks, it's like trying to catch a winged horse. And boy, do I see that when I paint outside, like a scene, a scene really any scene, but a scene like this. Because when you're painting outside, you're just getting like bludgeoned with information. 
the water's moving, the light's changing, the wind's blowing, you know, some days there's snow a little less than there's ice. I mean, there's no way that you can sit synthesize all the information that's coming into your eyes, but you take a great leap at it. And I think that's a, a quality of good artwork, that it, it's, it's not something that's completely controllable and attainable. It's like, it's like a direction that you're shooting towards something, and the energy of that creates a great work of art. Um, okay, next. I was thinking about um, I don't know if ever, any of you all have been to Brook Green Gardens, the um, sculpture garden, but I remember a sculpture there, and it's of a boy, and he's shooting arrows straight up. And I, I think that's such a great picture of creating artwork, but also our faith. We can't get our minds around God, no way, not even close, but we, we know the direction, it's like we're, we're, the, the energy of trying to soar up towards Him is, is life-giving. Okay. A lot of times I'll do a study, and on the next slide, I'll take the study back, and this is the study, all right, come on. And then I'll do a larger version in my studio using photographs. Um, there's a big debate about using photographs. So I'll just mention, um, I use a lot of photographs in my work, but I try, to stay, I, I try and stay out in front of learning pain as much as I can because I want my experience to be in reality, and a photograph is just a thin slice of reality, in my opinion. Wow. All right, go on. Um, this is that finished painting. Okay, next. This is, um, do you guys know this painting? This is uh, Rich Vestes. He was a photorealist, uh, maybe in the 50s, 60s. Um, I want to show you this painting because it's a beautiful example of what I think about as abstraction in painting. Um, to me, abstraction means the way something looks to your eyes. In other words, right now looking at you all, there's, there's all these little pieces of color and lines and shapes that are reaching my eyes that let me know what that is that I'm looking at. That's abstraction to me. And here you see like Richard Estes, he's so in tune, he's so in love with the visual facts. You know, and as far as painters go, that's the building blocks that we work with. We're not musicians, we're not writers. The, the building blocks of what we work with are visual facts. That's the mode that we use to convey whatever meaning we want to convey. All right, so next slide. Um, I'm going to quote, I want to give you a quote from Flannery O'Connor that I love, and it's basically saying the same thing. Flannery O'Connor is a um, Christian writer. She wrote famous for her short, short stories, and they're actually pretty brutal, but they're beautiful, they're powerful. Uh, depictions or criticisms of Phariseeism, most of them. Um, but she, she wrote a lot about writing fiction, and when I read it, I was like, wow, this is totally applicable to painting. So here's what she said. The beginning of human knowledge is through the senses, and the fiction writer begins where human perception begins. He appeals through the senses. And you cannot appeal to the senses with abstractions, and that She's using that term in a little bit different way. She, she means ideas there. Beginning fiction writers are conscious of problems, not people. Of questions and issues, and then this is the great line, instead of with all those concrete details of life that make actual the mystery of our position on earth. I love that sentence. So go on. This is a great example of this. This is uh, a drawing by Edward Hopper. Now this, this drawing, it's called the suicide. The reason I'm showing it to you is you, you wouldn't necessarily have to know anything about the drawing to know that something ominous, frightening, something bad is about to happen. Just because of the way it looks, the visual facts, the abstract uh, elements of the drawing convey the meaning. Okay? You guys know this one, this is uh, Rembrandt, I think it's 100 Gilder or something. Anyways, same thing, I think you wouldn't have to be a Christian at all or know the gospel to look at this and feel like something cataclysmic, something glorious, something tragic is happening just by the way it looks. So again, that, that's the building, block, building blocks of our trade. The meaning somehow has to be embedded in the building blocks that we're using. Okay, go on. This is a, a painting I did when I first came to Waynesville. 
And um, it's at this, uh, it's, I guess it's a sycamore, I'm not sure what kind of tree it was, but it was at a graveyard. And when I painted it, I really loved the scene. I, I started thinking, you know, it's, it's crying out for figures. And at the time, I was reading The Four Loves by C.S. Lewis, so I wanted to do four paintings of The Four Loves. So, next slide. I started thinking about figures that could go fit in that setting. Okay, next. And next. So this is a larger painting that grew out of that. And I was, I was thinking, see the birds flying through the trees? Um, I was thinking of the fleeting nature of, romant of romantic love. That's where Eros is what it is. Okay, next. This was the fourth painting in that series. This is Agape. So you guys know Agape. See, it's Lewis, it's Agape. Um, <laughs> but Agape is sacrificial love. It's unconditional love. It's godlike love. And this is kind of an example of the problems we face, as, especially as Christian painters, but I think, <coughs> uh, Christian artists. So I, how do you paint sacrificial love? Every, every idea I came up with, really struggled with it. It's like a cliche. Like a man burning into, uh, running into a burning building or like um, someone stooping down helping a homeless person. And it's like the form is not strong enough to carry the meaning. So I was walking around. We have, uh, luckily, we have a junkyard right next to our house. And um, I was walking around the junkyard collecting, uh, just looking for something for a craft. And all of a sudden I had and an inspiration is like, what if a guy is like caught in the junk? And the junk represents things in his life, like art, even, or technology, or good things, or even at his feet. It's hard to see, but there's a, a broken throne that he's holding on to. What if he's caught in all this junk? And around the rim, you can't see if his pit is this beautiful seascape, and that's the same beach from before. And coming down from that, from that lighted seascape is this, um, like a garment, and wrapping around him and pulling him out. And I felt like, yeah, that idea can, that, that, that vessel is strong enough to hold that idea. Um, okay, go on. This is um, kind of going back, this is a little bit more recent painting, but this, this kind of goes back to that same idea of, of if I could paint one painting in the world, just one. So this was a few years ago, and this painting comes from a memory, which I hope I know many of you have, and it's like when you're little, and it's evening, just the time when the, the light going down and the lights coming in the house are about the same, twilight, and your family's there, your cousins are playing like ghosts in the graveyard with your friends, and you can hear your your uh, parents, you know, like talking on the porch, you know, at any moment they're going to call you to go. And uh, just that, that moment is what I wanted to capture. So that's this painting. Okay, more. So I started by taking a lot of pictures of houses of this era that my grandfather lived in. I was really close to my grandfather, who was a farmer. Okay, go on. Go on. These are just different houses that I drew from, okay? I did color studies. Um, and the thing I was really interested in is, if you notice like a white house, when the light starts to go on, it's starting to get darker and darker and darker, and then the lights in the house are, are starting to get brighter. And right at that moment, they're not equal. That's what I, that's the time I was interested in. Okay, come on. This is a color study. Okay. And I, just different reference photos, okay. All right. <coughs> These are just my kids at the time, okay? <coughs> this one, it was in the middle of winter, and I was like, guys, you gotta get your uh, swimsuits on. <laughs> okay. Okay. This is the final drawing, okay? I wanted to show you on the right hand side, you see that landscape on the right hand side? I wanted to show you that. Um, okay, next slide. It comes from this painting, which I had done years before, and I. That beach I'm talking about is Topsail Beach, and it's really built, it's become built up. But that landscape was, was right on the coast there. And, and now it's like, it's all gone. It's like Walmart, shopping center, 
um, parking lot, and it's called the paint's called Magnolia. But even still, today when you go in that in that um, shopping center, there's a median, and what that Magnolia is still there. But I, okay, next slide. But I, I wanted to picture that landscape and my grandfather like going back, like he's passed on, but I'm like, like passing back in time, back into that era. And speaking about abstraction again, it wasn't until the end of the painting that I realized that, look, I, I put this, my, my grandfather walking off this way and almost equidistant as the little kid running off the other way, which was kind of neat. Okay. This is a, another painting. This one's in my gallery in Charlotte, and I, I don't know if this painting will ever sell because it's a little bit strange. But um, the idea for this painting is, um, I don't know if you've ever had the experience, but I, I often have it. If I'm at like a, some kind of event, like a wedding reception or a carnival or something, there's lots of activity of people. It's like my eye, my eye was, like, goes off to the side when there's some woods, and it's like they're sitting there silent all the time. It's like they've always been there. And I, I wanted to kind of capture that. And so the scene is, there's a scene in this house at, at holiday time, and all the families gather there. And unbeknownst to them, in a quiet corner of this farm, there's a, a squirrel tray that you can see into the tree and see this, this pulsating, warm life that's, that's kind of hidden. OK, go on. A painting like this often just starts like, it's just a flash, and I'll just write down quickly, just do a, 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 a basic thing, frozen palm the trees, it says snow or no. Um, I put darkest evening of the year, that's a, um, from Robert Frost poem, okay? <coughs> I think this was also, um, I think probably deep down I had some memories from the childhood book, so this is the great book, uh, I'm a Little Bunny. Uh, I love that illustration. Okay, go on. This is the scene from um, Wind in the Willows. When Mulder is stuck in the, yeah, in the snowstorm. Okay, go on. These are sketches. You can see I'm playing around with like woods on the right side, left side, all that. Okay? This is the final drawing, right? I walked around the fence rows. I found so much great information. Um, you can see like a chain on the fence there. So I took a lot of reference photos, okay? So played around with different ways to depict the squirrels, okay? And that's and the squirrels they have a um, like a corn cob where they've kind of gleaned off of the, the cornfield there, okay? Alright. This was I just want to show this because it was a real breakthrough. You know, you struggle with a painting and a real breakthrough is when I realized, wow, I can you can make the cornrows go in this sweeping arc over the house. And then that back tree line in the distance, it's like I couldn't conceive of that. And then I came up with the idea, look, I'm just going to simplify the one straight line that points to the house. So those were big breakthroughs in the painting. OK. OK. I enjoyed all the tiny details of the people in the house and the lights. OK. That was that painting. All right. So. With the rest of my time, I'm going to show you three paintings that are of biblical scenes. Um, and these are like, in a way, they're almost a separate thing. Galleries don't tend to like want to show, you know, a biblical painting. Um, so these paintings have been bought by various places, uh, like field uh, seminaries and stuff. But this was a, I wanted to do a painting of the Nativity. And I got the idea from a sermon I heard in New York City. Um, do you guys know that passage in Revelation where um, there's a dragon and a woman's giving birth and she's getting ready to uh, consume the baby? Or, and, and then the angels, it says there's war in heaven and there's angels defeat the, the enemy and his followers. So in the sermon, he said that's a picture of Christmas. Christmas is not just this quaint uh, hallmark scene. It's when, it's a, it was a supernatural invasion that, that God broke into our world. The su supernatural broke into our world. And when that happened, that spelled the end. As soon as that happened, that spelled the end of evil, of sin, of Satan. So that stuck in my head for many years. I was like, how can I picture that? Okay, go on. 
And early on you'll see, it's kind of hard to see it, but the idea was always the lamb's going to be at the foot of a cross, which is part of the stable, and that he's, his heavenly host is arcing down and driving demons into the darkness, and the, the people in the, in the nativity are almost unaware of it. Okay? So the, this is hard to see. Um, there's a little study, okay? It's a study of the stable. I wanted the stable to be a, an old Roman temple that was in decay. Because I wanted to show that, look, no matter how great and glorious are the powers of the world, they're in decay. Yeah. Um, so I want to sh it's kind of built out of that. Okay, go on. And I had fun doing this. I actually built a, a sculpture it's of, uh, using insulation and wood. And I, I held it up in the morning sun so I, could, I had all this great, meaty um, details to work from. So I built that. Okay. Took tons of reference photos. Go on. And, and like I said, I wanted Mary and Joseph and the baby to be to be like unaware. Like they're unaware of the, of the great cosmic realities that are happening on this night. Okay, go on. That was my wife's um, uh, one of her piano students. She was such a great model for Mary. Okay. I wanted the the lamb to be associated with the, the baby by, by means of that garment, okay? The cross is part of the stable, and I wanted it, you know, it's like leaning over the lamb, like it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna fall on the lamb. Okay, go on. This is a life-size, a life-size uh, drawing I did. Okay, go on. Now the, the heavenly host coming out, it's not really a heavenly host, I was thinking of like the citizen, citizenry of heaven. And I want that to be like, if you, if you guys have been to a foreign country, it's like, you know, you're just seeing things, and you're just like, what, you, know, you can't even process all the different things. That's what I wanted it to feel like. So I wanted this, this, this heavenly host coming down to, to comprise all the, the, the good things from God, whatever they are. So go on. That, that's the, so I want to even picture the, the three graces from mythology. Okay, go on. It's them. I put verb on them. Christmas carol verses and things on some of those banners, okay? The four figures that are driving the demons into the darkness, there's four of them because they, traditionally there were four seraphs, so I, I used that, okay? The guy in the middle was a great friend of mine, is a great friend of mine from way back at the North Academy. And, next slide. And he came from an absolutely terrible past. And this is a picture he came that he came to visit us, and later in his life he became a, he was saved. He became actually renewed his faith. And so when he came to our house, all my kids were around. So next slide. That's how I wanted to picture him, almost like this African king, right in the middle of this um, of this descending, you know, citizenry of heaven. Okay, come on. So that's the. Reference to the Old Testament and prophecy. Okay. Now the the demons, you can see from my work, I have painted a lot of like depicted a lot of like evil things. So that was a, a different thing for me. So the dragon in Revelation is theologically connected with the beast in Daniel, and that beast had seven heads. So I was picturing like a dragon with seven heads. Okay, go on. This is a drawing for all these demons, and I wanted to represent various aspects of evil, so I started to research, like, what does it mean that something is evil? Okay? Okay, go on. So, like, this is one part. I don't know if you noticed, there was a, a wedding, a married couple at the very top of the and juxtaposed to them is romantic love that's, like, twisted in some way. So you see their faces are, like, fused together. A spider is like, is, is totally like, God is in its clutches. Okay, come on. Everyone asks me about it, it's like, what's the deal with the clown? Well, like, I, saw, I saw, it's actually from a real picture from the 50s of a real clown, and I saw the picture, I was like, that's terrifying. That's what the devil is, is delight and suffering. Enjoyment of someone else's suffering. So I thought, I'm going to have this clown holding this I'm a monitor of a baby in ICU and just totally enjoying it. Okay, one. This figure in the middle there, I wanted to, to depict 
uh, religion, I'm not sure whether it's with a capital R or lowercase r, but religion, um, meaning any, any system that men come up with where it's like, if I do X, Y, and Z, that puts me apart from everyone else, and God owes me um, salvation. I probably got that idea drilled into my head because, I don't know if you guys know Tim Keller, but we were in, all the years we were in New York, we went to Redeemer, and that was like every sermon. So um, anyways, I wanted to, to depict that. The, the bad, go back, the, the baboons are um, depicting like cold bureaucracy that just rolls over people, utilitarianism. Okay. This is just process, okay? That's the final painting. And it's a pretty big painting. It's the largest painting I could get out of my studio. So it was a nine by seven foot of the painting. And, and on all these paintings, the, um, it's kind of hard to see, but I've, I've carved the, the scripture in the frame. And I'll tell you, the first time I did it, I did it by hand with the Dremel, and it's like, nah, I'm never doing that again. And so I got somebody to do it for me. <laughs> The second one I want, I want to show you is I was commissioned to do on the scene of foot washing. And when I heard that, I was not super happy because it was not a, a story in the Gospels that I felt very warm. I just didn't, it didn't appeal to me, that story, for whatever reason. But the more I studied it and painted it, I really got into it. All right, go on. Just in the studio, okay? For this painting, I used like a Photoshop program and like played around with the figures. I don't always do that, but for this, it really helped. Okay, go on. The, the thing that I wanted to portray in this painting is the reaction of all the disciples. That look, this is their master. He is someone that they're starting to realize is God incarnate. And he's kneeling down, doing what back, back then was like the most menial, dirty job, and they're trying to process that, like, trying to figure out what that means, okay, come on. So I, you know, I got all my friends because that's free models, and uh, <laughs> got them to pose in various attitudes and reaction to this, okay. This is a model I use for Christ in this painting and the next one, it's a friend of mine, okay. This is the last of my painting I'm going to show you. And I kind of chose this one at the end because I feel like it kind of sums up some of the things, and some of the elements I've talked about. And this painting, this the same people wanted, all right, we've got a painting of foot washing of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. We want the painting of the woman washing Jesus' feet. So there's two scenes of that. One scene is Mary and Bethany, right before Jesus is crucified, she anoints his feet. That's not it. This is the scene in, I think it's Luke 5, this is earlier on, this is in Capernaum. And this is when a, a quote, quote, uh, sinful woman um, comes into a place where Jesus is eating with the Pharisees, and she's weeping, and she starts to wipe his feet with her hair. And it says that the Pharisees are like, why, why are you letting this woman touch you? you know, she's unclean, she's a sinful woman, she's dirty. And Jesus basically says, um, you know, but guys, you've not shown me any consideration, any care since I've been here. Look at what this woman is doing. And then the, kind of the, the, the big line is, look, because she's been forgiven much, she loves much. So, okay, next slide. When I started trying to figure this painting out, I kept landing in the Sunday school world, meaning it was all like Sunday school, Sunday school kind of pictures. So like I kept thinking like white togas, whitewashed walls, arches. It's like I couldn't get my head out of that. Okay, go on. This is an early study, and you can see I'm struggling like, because look, you've got to convey the story. The details have to be there of the environment. Anna has to have this great abstract design. So you can see the Pharisees are on the right, kind of with Jesus in the darkness there. Okay, go on. And then I went to my brother's, I was on my brother's front porch in, uh, in uh, Signal Mountain. And it hit me like a flash. And what I remembered was, 
When I was a student at IU, I went to Italy for a summer, and that was the best summer of my life. And I remember what it felt like uh, on some of those like stone terraces with the sun just like beating down, and then the coming through the trees, like the dab of sunlight on these stone terraces. It was a real vivid memory for me. And as soon as I remembered that, I was like, that's that Mediterranean setting. And then I thought, you know, the woman needs to be in the darkness with the Pharisees. And she needs to be like emerging out of that judgment and coming into the light where Jesus is. And where the Pharisees are all like rigid lines and the stonework is all like rigid stonework. As you move to the light, um, like, go on. These are early studies. I'm going to interrupt myself. Sorry. Go on. This is a... Uh, Early color study. Um, this is the, as soon as I had this idea, I started to work with models. Okay, go on. Okay. They were really fun to work with. Okay, go on. That's a, right before I started painting, all right? So, getting back to what I was saying, even the stonework where it's all like, Rigid lines, as you move into the light towards Jesus, I picture, I, I'm going to have the, the flowers and organic growth like breaking up through the, the grout, even. I also wanted a swap in the clothing that Jesus is wearing and the woman is wearing. So the woman is wearing white now, and Jesus is the one wearing dark. So there's the substitution that, that's happening. Okay, go on. This is the final drawing on the canvas, okay? See the Pharisees, and I wanted the Pharisees on there. <laughs> I didn't want the Pharisees to be just all cliche, like, like uh, Pharisee you think of. I wanted, I wanted them to be in various attitudes of like, some angry, some startled, some are like thoughtful, some are feel like even embarrassed. Okay, go on. This is a drawing I did, go on. My son posed for one of the Pharisees. Okay, go on. But I, I wanted the Pharisees, I think that that happens in any group. I wasn't just thinking about Pharisees, but I was thinking about any group that, that even today, where Jesus words uh, come in to that group. There's like, he catches us on every side. There's no one that doesn't react in some way that's not caught in some way. So I wanted to picture that. Okay, go on. So that was the final painting. I'm, I'm going to show you one last painting and close up. Go on. This is a painting um, from the Morris Museum of Art in Augusta. That's where I grew up in Augusta. And last time I was there, it's really hard to see this. I wish you could see it better. But um, last time I was there, I stood in front of this painting. Like, man, I love this painting. Because to me, it's a picture of what what it's like to be a human being dropped into the universe, or even all of humanity dropped into the universe, because we're like such a tiny spark in all the oceans of time and space. And I see that in this painting. It's like there's this one little craft, and you can't see it, but there's three people on it, and they're dwarfed by this landscape. And it's a beautiful landscape, but it's a haunting landscape. And it's just like the universe that we've been dropped into. It's, it's a beautiful place, but it's also a dangerous, um, it's a scary place, too. Um, so why am I showing you this? I'm showing you this because, in my opinion, well, you guys know, in a lot of ways, we live in a post-Christian culture. By that, I mean, a lot of people we talk to, they don't know anything about the Bible. They don't know the stories of the Bible. It's not a given. But, I feel like thoughtful people are asking very fundamental questions, like, why, why am I even here? Like, what is my purpose? Do I have any, is there any meaning? Is there such a thing as meaning? What's right and wrong? Is there such a thing as right and wrong? Can you even know it? Is there such a thing as the universe with something above it like God or supernatural, or is this universe all there is? They're asking very fundamental questions. And, you know, I was thinking about um, our daughter. She was a freshman last year at a university, and 
There were so many suicides at that university. And that's happening a lot. And I think it is because there's a crisis in media. So I think painting can speak to that, or art can speak to that in a powerful way, answering some of those fundamental questions. One example, think about when, when someone paints, just in a, in a powerful way, the beauty of like flowers on the table. If they, if they do that with passion and they do it with skill, and it's compelling. It's like, to me, that artist is putting a flag in the sand, and they're saying, this experience that I'm having of beauty, it's not just a chemical reaction going on in my brain, there's something important. There's something going on more and more and more true, above and beyond the material facts. And the painting can really do that. So that's why, Brief sermon, and even that sermon, long sermon. That's, that's all. I'll take questions now.